have any beekeepers in the audience? Hey, <laughs> that's great. So any beekeeper would be able to tell you that uh, bees are truly amazing creatures. A uh, honeybee, for example, would set out from its hive, do a meandering search for food. It could fly up to 10 kilometers looking for the food. When it finds the food, it literally make a straight line, a bee line, back home. So clearly, uh, these bees are extremely competent at actually perceiving the world and navigating within it. And they're all doing this with a brain that's about the size of a sesame seed and weighs about a milligram. So clearly these guys are using something very clever and neat and unexpected that we like to learn about and profit from and just enjoy as pure basic scientists. That's one of the goals of our lab, to find out what it is that actually makes these creatures tick and tick so well. The other goal of our lab is, if we do discover that these creatures do something really neat and cool, can we copy some of these ideas or inspire ourselves to develop, for example, vision systems for guiding aircraft that are based on biological inspiration of the kind we learn from these tiny, incredible flying creatures. That's the second mission of our lab. Now, through the years um, studying uh, bees, uh, one of the major insights we've gained is that flying insects rely rather heavily on the image motion that's induced in their eyes as they fly in the environment. And by an analyzing that pattern of image motion, they're able to work out the three-dimensional structure of the world through which they're flying. Now, the idea is very simple. Let's say you're flying along a straight line or driving along a highway, for example. You notice that the trees lining the highway, which are quite close to you, whiz by your visual field very rapidly. And this high speed of image motion tells you that these objects are actually very close to you. All right? On the other hand, things are that are much further away, for example, uh, a distant hill or the clouds in the sky or the sun, the images of these objects move very slowly or not at all as you move along in a straight line. And that slowness of image motion tells you that these objects are very far away. So insects seem to analyze the pattern of image motion that they experience to work out how far away objects are and avoid collisions with them and things like that. So now if I could go to the next slide. So if you looked at a bee flying through a hole in your window, <laughs> you might find that it flies fairly precisely through the middle of the hole. In other words, it balances the distance to the left and right rims rather precisely as it's flying through. Now, the way we think it's doing this is actually measuring the speed of motion of this rim in this eye and that rim in the other eye and positioning itself so that these two speeds are equal. If they're equal, it means it's flying down the middle. If it's higher on one side, it means it's flying too close to that side, right? So it moves away from that side to compensate. Simple way of flying through a narrow passage without colliding into the edges. Now, do bees really use this strategy that I mentioned? You can't actually ask the bee that question because it cannot give you the answer. So you have to devise an experiment that tells you the answer, right? So here's the experiment. So we train bees to come and feed at the sugar water feeder placed over there. They fly through a tunnel. The inside of this tunnel is lined with a visual pattern, for example, black and white stripes in this case. Uh, and by the way, um, no bees were killed or harmed in this in these experiments. Uh, there's, no, there's no coercion either. The boy is not forced to come to our apparatus. The only reason why they come to us is because the food we have on offer is so much better than anything else they can find in the neighborhood, right? So they're truly voluntary participants of this experiment. Okay, so what we do is we have these bees flying down the, the tunnel, and we film them from above using a video camera. And, and we find, sure enough, the bees are flying fairly precisely down the middle of the tunnel, as you see over there. However, if you take one of these walls now and move it in the same direction as the incoming bee, these walls are mounted on conveyor belts, so you can move these walls, um, you find the bee flies a lot closer to the moving wall. So evidently what's happening here is because the bee and the wall are moving in the same direction, the image speed, as experienced by the left eye, is quite low, so the bee thinks that wall is much further away, so it moves much closer to that wall to compensate. Yeah, does that make sense? On the other hand, if I move this wall in the opposite direction to the bee's flight, then the bee is going in one direction, the wall is going in the opposite direction, that left eye experiences a huge image velocity, so the bee says, well, there's something dangerously close here, I better move away from this wall to compensate. And that's what we're seeing here. So this simple experiment really tells us that bees really are using the strategy of balancing the image motion, or optic flow, as it's called, to navigate safely down corridors. 
And it turns out now that since we published this work, a number of robotics labs <laughs> have built a ground-based robot to navigate down corridors using the same principle. It turns out to be computationally very simple and cheap to do it this way, the way nature does it. Now, how does an insect make a smooth landing? Landing is a challenging thing. This is why they pay aircraft pilots so much. It's a tricky business. You're going to decelerate and make an appropriately smooth landing. So if you train a bee to come and uh, feed at a, a drop of sugar water over here, and film it as it's coming into land using high-speed stereo cameras, and then reconstruct these flight trajectories and analyze them, you find that actually as they come closer and closer to the ground, they're flying slower and slower. So when they're actually very close to the ground, they're flying at a very low speed, so they don't hurt themselves, make a nice smooth landing. And the way they're doing it, it turns out, they're actually keeping the image velocity of the ground constant as they come in. If you approach the surface and all the time adjust your speed so that the image velocity of the ground appears to be the same, then you automatically fly slower and slower as you get closer and closer to the ground. They make a, finally make a beautiful smooth landing. The beauty about landing in this way is that you don't need to know how far away you are from the surface at any time. You don't need to know how rapidly you're approaching the surface. All you have to do is to keep the image velocity of the ground constant and everything else works as though it's by magic. <laughs> Just a beautiful biological autopilot that we're not putting into our aircraft. Now, when a bee has found a good food source, it comes back home and does this dance, as some of you may know, to tell its other nest mates where the good food source is so that they can also go and gather nectar from it. And the dance takes the form um, of, a, of a figure of eight like this. It consists of alternating left and right hand loops. And every time the bee has finished one of these loops, it waggles its abdomen from side to side. It's called the waggle phase. And that's a very stereotyped sort of dance, part of the dance. And it turns out that the direction of this waggle phase is proportional to the distance to the food source. So the longer the duration of the waggle, the further away the food source. But here's an example of a waggle dance. That's the mark we that's doing the waggle. Every time she's finished the loop, it's doing the waggle. And I would say, looking at the waggle, that food source is probably about a kilometer away, give or take. <laughs> now, now, how does the bee work out how far it's gone? Because it has to come back and tell the other bees how far away the food source is, right? So here's an experiment that discovers, tries to understand how that happens. So you train bees to fly from a hive through a pattern tunnel like this to a feeder. They come back, and you observe their dance. And they do a nice, strong, waggle dance. This tunnel, by the way, is lined with vertical black and white stripes. This tunnel, same, same bee again, is being trained now to fly through a blank tunnel, which carries no visual pattern at all goes to the feeder. When you look at these bees when they come back and dance, they're showing no waggle at all. So what we think is going on is that bees are measuring how far they've flown by measuring how much image motion they've experienced in the world as they fly from the hive to the food source. And in this case, because they see a, a pattern, um, they're, uh, they're experiencing a lot of image motion, so they think they've gone a long way. Uh, on the other hand, here, when they're flying in a blank, a blank tunnel, there's no motion, so the odometer is not even ticking, right? <laughs> so they don't think they're traveling distance. And it turns out, although this might seem unreliable, it actually turns out to be a very reliable and robust way to figure out how far you've flown. Because uh, let's say you use some other measure, for example, time of flight. If you measure time of flight, that will depend very much on how fast or slow you fly to the food source. You've got to keep, keep track of that as well. Complicated. If you measure energy consumed to get there, that's also not very reliable, because you could be flying against a headwind or flying in a tailwind. And you can stop them might be different. That's also not a reliable way. So measuring odometry using visual motion seems to be kind of reliable and robust way to do it. And that's how we're doing it for our aircraft that I'll show you later. So our goals for autonomous navigation are, first of all, to be completely independent and self-contained, like, an, like an insect or a bird. We don't want to use GPS. This is also becoming more and more relevant because drones are now going to be used more and more in indoor environments where you don't have access to GPS. The other issue is, for example, planetary exploration. If you're sending robots to explore Mars, there's not going to be GPS satellites on Mars for a long time. So you're going to have to really behave or rely on your own senses, rather like an insect or a bird, right? And that's what we're trying to put into our aircraft, make them completely independent. The other thing we want to do, our challenge, because insects do it this way, is to rely purely on vision-based guidance. We don't want to use radar or any other complicated, bulky, heavy, expensive equipment. We want to see what we can do with just pure vision the way bees and the bees and the birds do it. Okay, so here's a view of a bee eye. 
Bees have compound eyes, as you know, so they have a right compound eye and a left compound eye. Each one of these eyes has a visual field that covers roughly one hemisphere. So the two eyes together endow the being with a panoramic view of the environment, an all-round view of the environment. And we've sort of incorporated that in our, in our vision system by having two cameras placed back to back. Each one of these has a wide angle lens. So again, you've got a complete 360 degree coverage of the environment. Another cool thing that insects do, they're able to scan the profile of the horizon all around them and use that to work out what the instantaneous orientation is as they're flying. Now, the idea is very simple. Let's say I'm flying along a straight line, and I find that the horizon on one side has gone down, and on the other side has gone up. It means I have rolled to the left, yeah, and vice versa. On the other hand, if the horizon in the front has gone down, it means I've pitched up. If it's gone up, it means I've pitched down. Very simple, right? So by monitoring the panoramic horizon profile around me, I can monitor exactly what my attitude and flight attitude is and control it if I want to. So here's an example of a vision system we built to do this. So it's monitoring the orientation of the aircraft. That was a tight turn. That was a loop. It's also been tried quite successfully. Okay, now this, illustrates, this video illustrates the basic elements of visual guidance that we put into this aircraft. So we're taking off now autonomously. These are the two fisheye images that are combined together to form a panoramic image. We use the horizon profile to, to work out the aircraft's orientation and stabilize it. Uh, the sky, the clouds in the sky and the sun are used as the compass to work out the heading direction and control the heading direction. We're also keeping track of how far we're traveling uh, by measuring the motion of the ground. That tells us how high we are, how fast we're traveling, and also what our progress on the ground is. You'll see pretty soon these imaginary virtual yellow circles being dropped. They're not actually physical circles being dropped. They're, they're sort of virtual circles to keep track of our progress. Every, each one of those signifies 25 meters of forward progress on the ground. Now, we're coming into land, and again, we're doing a B-inspired landing by measuring the image motion of the ground and regulating it to make a, a really nice, smooth landing. So all of this is done without any GPS or anything like that. So, so it turns out these landings are actually very smooth, and even smoother than our best young student pilots, because the system is very quickly responsive, so it re reacts to wind gusts and so on in a very, very, very useful way. So this is our, from my final slide. It's, it's, this is now a challenge is fully automated flight. And the challenge here is to take off from the airstrip, uh, fly a certain distance, achieve a certain altitude, and then turn back and come back and land from where we took off without using any GPS information, using just your vision, visual sensors, right? Just vision. Uh, and the turning around is also done just to make life a little more interesting and challenging for us. We don't simply turn around, we do a, a, an aerobatic maneuver called an implement turn, which consists of a half loop followed by a half row. If you do that, then very quickly you're flying in the opposite direction. <laughs> so let's see how that works. So we're taking off. Those are the imaginary circles being dropped on the ground. By the way, the aircraft is not seeing any disks over there. It's just us putting these disks on the, on the video to keep track of our progress. So we're gaining altitude. We're going further away from the airstrip. And pretty soon, you will see this turn, this movement turn. That's the half loop followed by the half row. And now we're heading back. As you can see, we're retracing our steps. We're following those uh, white dots there, although we don't, don't see the white dots. It's just a uh, regular where we've been, and we're coming into land. You can see people scurrying out of the way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so mission accomplished. So, um, well, I was trying to think of a good way to conclude the, this presentation. I was uh, boarding a flight to go somewhere, and I happened to be going along the airway, and I found this very interesting ad, which uh, basically says it all. Um, and look, uh, we even endowed this bee with a vision system, very similar to what we have on our aircraft. So thank you very much.